you know, we have this problem. These offices of labor standards are really exciting and have a real potential, uh, but they're being slowed down uh, by this influx of cases from uh, small immigrant and minority owned businesses, um, and it's which in turn is raising an equity issue. So we're trying to figure out how do we clear the deck of the cases that Jen described from the Thai restaurant, right? These are the question, the cases where the issue doesn't seem to be willful, it seems to be capacity. Uh, and this is the, this is uh, getting in the way of the OLSs from doing what uh, the strategic work they want to do, and um, it doesn't seem fair. So what we uh, are doing is trying to come up with a pilot intervention to address these concerns. Uh, and we're doing it in partnership with the Minnesota uh, Office of Labor Standards. And Main Street Alliance. Ah, yes, of course. Uh, good point. <laughs> and Main Street Alliance, as you see here on our slide, uh, is our community partner. They're a group that organizes uh, small businesses uh, that are looking to uh, undertake high road employment practices. No. There we go. Okay. So, uh, what we did was we did turn to the literature uh, to try to understand uh, these businesses before. And uh, we keep saying it, I don't know if it's a term outside of the US, but uh, BIPOC stands for Black Indigenous People of Color. Uh, and sometimes I BIPOC adds immigrant to the front of it. Um, and so when you look at the history of these businesses, it was really revealing to us uh, what, what the you know, it really complicates the whole notion of a small business owner. You know, there's this whole, the American dream is being a small business owner. Uh, and instead what the literature on these businesses show is that uh, people of color often turn to uh, entrepreneurship or self-employment uh, because of their negative experiences in the traditional labor market. So it's not so much that you're opening a corner store because you want to, but because no one would hire you at the white owned firm, right? Um, and so uh, scholars have typically broke this down into you know, barriers and opportunities. And the key here is that even these opportunities, as you see here, they're often marginal, right? These aren't businesses that uh, typically stand to make great profits. Um, and so in the same, and you know, some of the literature even goes so far as to describe uh, uh, BIPOC businesses as in a liminal state between worker and truly independent uh, owner. And so uh, given this history, it, it, it calls for this uh, different approach to enforcement that the uh, experiences from Jen and Ellen highlight as well. Um, we also know that solving problems with uh, these small businesses is a major part of the key to creating good jobs. 52% uh, of Americans uh, work at small businesses, and these numbers are even higher for people of color uh, and, their, uh, and for low-income workers. Uh, at the same time, uh, in a recent study from Gallup, they actually found that very small employers want to do the right thing, right? Uh, they, very small employers actually are more likely to offer benefits than medium-sized businesses, right? Because um, there's often a community tie and connection, right? These are often family-run businesses. Uh, similarly, uh, there's a real reason to invest in these businesses because it keeps money in the community. Uh, uh, for every $100 spent at a small uh, community business, $48 stays in the local community compared to only $14 for a big box retail store. Uh, at the same time, as we said, you know, the research shows that these small business owners are often in the same boat as their employees. Uh, they're experiencing similar financial health, often making similar amounts of money. And so ensuring the profitability of these small businesses in turn ensures the job quality uh, for their employees. So as we said, we're looking at the Minnesota context. Uh, so the, uh, this is from data uh, that we were able to obtain on uh, the industries where uh, minority and immigrant businesses are located. Um, and as you see, it the best overwhelming is restaurants, which, uh, as Jen and Ellen said, is one of the highest uh, violation industries. Um, and you know the other industries that are uh, prevalent are uh, you know um, service sector industries. Uh, similarly, 
uh, the demographics are in line with what the literature said. Uh, most of these businesses uh, owned by uh, BIPOC people in Minneapolis are very small. Uh, uh, nearly all have uh, under uh, uh, 20 employees and their sales volume is very low. Uh, uh, almost all make less than 500,000 and very, very few make over a million, right? Um, so this shows that, they're, that you know, these businesses are struggling, which in turn uh, drives their struggling uh, with non-compliance. Um, in terms of the uh, breakdown, uh, the titles here are a little confusing because I believe, weirdly, this database includes Africa in the Middle East here, but this follows what we know were the, the three big target communities um, that we are working with are uh, Latinx, Somali in Minneapolis, and then uh, South Asian, or sorry, uh, African American. There is also a big uh, South Asian community, but this data uh, inclu um, includes broader, a lot of the South Asians live across the river in St. Paul, which is technically a separate city. Um, our analysis of the Office of Labor Standards data further uh, highlights this picture. Um, so this isn't just minority-owned businesses, this is all small businesses, uh, but 55% of cases uh, were at small businesses with less than 30 employees, and of that, 38% had less than 20 employees. Uh, these numbers are also likely to be undercounts, because this is only the cases where uh, the number of employees were recorded, which was only a fraction of the overall numbers. Um, Just want to point out, this was work that was done by Big Barn. In, in coordination with Andrew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Of our team. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm so also, we had someone who couldn't come. I'm present, presenting on no, the team's work here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, and so, the, as we said, the program uh, that we're going to undertake uh, aims to focus in the uh, immigrant and BIPOC communities in Minneapolis. Uh, and we were, uh, it, our suspicion that the need for this focus was confirmed when we dug into the Office of Labor Standards data. Um, uh, it highlighted the need to focus in particular on food service and retail. So this is all uh, labor violations and uh, you know, of the four highest uh, uh, food service and retail, which are, have a large number of BIPOC were uh, the highest violators. And then as we said, uh, this focus on the need to provide back office uh, HR support was highlighted by the cases that are most likely to be violated. So as Ellen uh, explained, uh, uh, as Ellen and Jen explained, it's the confusing laws that have like a curl system, such as paid sick leave, where these businesses are having violations. And as you see in Minneapolis, this accrual sick and safe time is uh, the major driver of violations in the office's casework. Uh, so given all this data, uh, we decided to focus on food service and retail. And given this sick and safe, we decided to focus on payroll and bookkeeping. Uh, so just to summarize the academic li literature, we know that small businesses don't have enough of a voice. Uh, we know that support needs to be ongoing. So as Jen described, even when they uh, remediated a violation, when they checked in six months later, they'd fallen out of compliance, not necessarily because they meant to, but because they lacked the capacity. Uh, we also know from the literature on how to make change in these communities that you need to involve uh, community intermediaries. Uh, thinking broadly here, this could be uh, immigrant groups, it could be churches, mosques, et cetera. Um, and we know that uh, our definition of enforcement has to become holistic. It can't just be about uh, the, the sticks. We have to implement carrots as well uh, and support. Uh, and we need to not we move beyond a one size fits all model. So uh, we've focused on three pillars of support based off of uh, what we know about Minneapolis and what we've read in the literature. Uh, the first thing that our pilot program is going to do uh, is we uh, received uh, uh, initial seed funding from the city and the city is essentially going to provide centralized back office support for these businesses. So when we said uh, 
you know, it's really hard to figure out the accrual system, the city's going to provide them payroll to ensure, which will, you know, remediate these problems, uh, hopefully. Additionally, we're aiming to move to an ongoing support model. So a lot of the existing programs, so say there's a violation, the city will send them to the Office of Small Business Support, they'll meet with a case manager, maybe they'll help them get a website or uh, get in touch with an accountant, case is closed. They never hear from them again. And everything we've seen in the cases where, where uh, real change has been made with these communities, you, you have to create an ongoing relationship. Uh, so uh, that's another key thing. And then finally, uh, we, and this is the thorniest one that we don't, uh, Michael will talk about, have fully figured out, uh, we want to increase government coordination. So we want to break down the silo between the Office of Labor Enforcement and the Office of Small Business Development to try to get the supporting small business team and the uh, making sure small business is our compliance team to work together on cases um, and solve these problems. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll go through this really quick, uh, but uh, one of the key things is when we started doing, we got kind of concerned when we started doing our interviews with the small businesses, because the question was, we would go to them and say, okay, what do you need to flourish, to make sure your employees flourish? And they all would say, the banks are racist, I need access to capital. And we were like, we're not a bank, we can't provide you bank loans. And so we were we were worried at first, um, and, and this is a real problem in the US. And, and, and the other thing that we always highlight too, as you see here, minority firms have the worst situation, but the majority of white owned small businesses also have act, uh, difficulty access credit. So it's a general small business problem, um, but made much worse because of systemic racism. Uh, and what we found though, when we dug into this is that the providing the payroll, providing the bookkeeping that we're going to we're aiming to provide, provides the track record for these businesses that makes it far easier to apply for loans. Uh, and for government contracts, which was another big service. Um, so we just wanted to point that out as well. So what are we gonna actually do? Um, so from our conversations with businesses in Minneapolis and organizations that work to support them, we've kind of put together this life cycle uh, of, of a small business's growth. Um, and uh, something that was stressed to us was the importance of starting on the correct path. And where what that was explained to us as is, providing bookkeeping, right? And providing the knowledge at the beginning. Uh, then, and so the key here is the stuff in orange is what we're going to provide in, co uh, in combination with the city's funding. Uh, whereas the blue stuff is the stuff the city already does, okay? Or, or uh, contractors that the city works with already does. And we don't wanna reinvent the wheel. We're working to coordinate and bring these into the project in a streamlined way but we're not, we're not gonna reinvent mentoring when so much of that is already happening. Uh, so we, the first step is we wanna provide bookkeeping, but then we're gonna to try to connect these businesses to all uh, the wealth of resources on mentoring in a more centralized way. And then we're gonna provide uh, this back office HR support, payroll accounting HR, uh, which in turn goes to a second round of mentoring to then help them get to uh, capital growth. Excuse me. So, uh, how are we gonna do this? Uh, so we're the first phase is gonna begin in January with 30 to 50 businesses uh, where we're gonna start by providing subsidized payroll and bookkeeping. And then the hope is eventually to expand uh, to point of sales and ad other additional HR support uh, and expand to more businesses. Uh, we're targeting, as I said, a restaurant and food service. Uh, we're setting the cap at, at 15, uh, in restaurants, tend in retail at the full-time equivalent employees. Uh, we're focused on uh, geographic areas of underinvestment, so the uh, BIPOC communities, uh, and we're gonna have a preference uh, for, for BIPOC and immigrant-owned businesses as well. We've convened a community roundtable that includes all the government stakeholders as well as a uh, Main Street Alliance and a bunch of small businesses. Uh, the businesses that are part of the roundtable will also give be given preference for uh, the, the program. Um, and then we're gonna also, as a condition of joining, ask the businesses to agree to coming into compliance, right? Um, so where are we at so far? So the city, uh, 
has given us an initial seed funding of $125,000. Uh, Actually, $150,000. I've been wrong all this time. Oh, even we just found an extra $25,000. Yep. Uh, and so uh, this is going to get uh, to fund phase one. Uh, the uh, for reasons I won't bore you about, it's better for the city for it to be administered by a nonprofit, not by the city directly. So they issued a right for proposal uh, that was awarded to a group in October. Um, and the hope is uh, to start getting applications uh, in, in uh, December for these businesses and start providing these services uh, in early 2023. 20, uh, um, yeah. yeah, okay. Uh, so I, there, we can talk about the qualitative later. And then the second round, we uh, just got funding to do a random controlled trial uh, when we expand the program next summer. We can talk about that in Q&A.